I heard someone mention water, and that is something you're going to hear a lot about in the moment. This is a subject, extreme weather, disruption, and what does that mean for all aspects of property? Whether you are an owner, an occupier, a developer, an investor, an insurer, or whether you have the role of running a city, what we're about to talk about affects you. So this is one of these few topics that goes right across the board. It's not on many people's radar screens at the moment, but it should be. It's one of those hidden things that really knocks you for six when it happens. So we have three fantastic speakers. Kate Brown from Grosvenor is going to be presenting on resilient cities. Greg Lowe is going to be presenting on it from, from Willis is going to be presenting on it, the insurance implications. And then Henk Ovik from the Netherlands, but who has been working recently post Sandy reconstruction in the States, is going to give us the view from that country, which knows more about water and extreme weather uh, from the Netherlands. So we are going to give you the, the outlines center, of their, the, that, that part the of the link, story uh, that they the deal center, with the gallery, which... and give you as much information um, as they can, and then we'll open it up for a discussion afterwards. So, Kate, would you like to begin? So, a disruptive force, extreme weather. I think the distinctive characteristic about a disruptive force, and we started to hear this this morning with technology, is that it results in a breakthrough or a step to change. So a new normal, there was a lot of talk about that this morning. And critically, not a reversion to the past, so a lasting transformation. And sometimes, as we have seen, a disruption can be incredibly swift and complete. And the devastation here in, in High End in the Philippines um, it was accompanied by enormous human tragedy and the speed and ferocity of this event and really typical of extreme weather events is huge. However, a disruptive force can also be slow moving and almost imperceptible as it sort of initially as it carves out its transformation. And of course, arguably the slower disruptors are the most dangerous as they lull leaders into this sort of full sense of security, believing that there's time to deal with the problem. And of course, that's the case with climate change and global warming. The end result, though, is the same. The disruptive force leaves a sort of permanent imprint <coughs> on society and businesses, and they can't continue to operate in the way which they did before. So as we heard this morning, you know, there are huge risks for companies which aren't attuned to the disruptive forces and aren't thinking about them. Um, you know, hindsight is a wonderful thing that we can apply now to many industries, but at the outset, there is little certainty. Um, and in fact, there are significant uncertainties so whilst the signs sort of that something is approaching might begin to become clear, you know, what that will be, when it will happen, and how it will manifest itself all remain unclear. I think, you know, we'll hear obviously from Greg and, and um, Henk about how um, this is having implications on the industries, but I think for the real estate industry as a whole, this has enormous implications, as Judith started to say. So a new normal. And are we prepared for it? Do we, the real estate industry, have the tools to evaluate the risk and the opportunity? Can we start to make decisions in this environment of enormous uncertainty with confidence? You know, and to the question that we were posed, what are the practical investment implications of extreme weather on real estate? And this is something, I don't know how, how much you all know about Grosvenor, but interests us because we do think very long term. Um, so when you sort of start to think, well, how can we start to evaluate these issues systematically, all these complexities? And that's something we're particularly interested in. We're invested in 65 cities internationally, and we take this long-term view. So starting to think, well, how could we decide between cities almost in terms of long-term planning where we want to deploy our capital internationally? Now, historically, we'd made decisions around where to invest evaluated on the value drivers, essentially, as I see them as city level of GDP, connectivity, and livability. But when we started thinking about the sort of the new norm, as it were, these seemed inadequate. They don't take into account the risks associated with the disruptive forces of which extreme weather is one. Um, so if you take this sort of longer term perspective and you really believe that sustainable or successful real estate projects depend on long term stability and prosperity, then you need to really systematically think about that risk. So when we started trying to think about this, we 
basically set about this research report, which does, as Judith started talking about, um, rank 50 global cities. Um, and the measure which we chose to do that by was resilience. That's a word we hear a lot. And what did we mean when we were thinking about resilience? Well, we started with the IPCC definition. So this ability to absorb disturbances and to sort of have the capacity to adapt to the stress and the change. And this is obviously a process of enormous change and, and therefore huge implications for cities and for us as investors in cities internationally. But that seemed too sort of you know, high level and um, we really needed to pin it down to our sector and our industry. And so we sort of almost reinterpreted that for our purposes and said, okay, well, we think for city level real estate industry, this means the ability of cities to thrive as centers of human habitation, production and cultural development, despite these challenges, despite the disruptive forces, essentially, of climate change, population growth and globalization. And the implications for the property sector um, are inevitably that re resilience will allow cities, we feel, to preserve capital values and generate sustainable rental income in the long term. You know, it's fair to say city resilience isn't a new concept, um, and there have been many tries and, and sort of tested ways of looking at this. Um, our particular approach models resilience as a function of a city's vulnerability and adaptive capacity. So vulnerability being a function of exposure, how frequently will events happen, and the sensitivity, you know, what will the impact be on the city of those events. And the adaptive capacity determines um, the city's potential to cope with those events. So essentially it's what vulnerability mitigated or moderated by adaptive capacity. And adaptive capacity is both reactionary and predictive. So it's you know, the city's ability to moderate and adjust to potential impacts and threats and to cope with the events when they do occur and really capitalise on those opportunities. So it's worth saying that this study did go far broader than just extreme weather events, which is obviously what we're focusing on today. But to give you a flavour of what we looked at, we started with um, vulnerabilities, so climate, that's physical events, um, so really what we're talking about today, sea level change, hurricanes, typhoons, wildfire, floods, droughts. Um, and community was looking far more at sort of the, the sources of social tension, so affordability, which we all know is something um, incredibly um, topical in our markets at the moment, education, health facilities, it's sort of real cultural freedom and corruption. So, you know, what, what, what is the sort of ultimate um, in a city that you would be looking for? Infrastructure. Um, as if, going back to the definition of, you know, to function as a centre of habitation, of production and culture, cities need infrastructure. So we looked at housing and transport infrastructure and basic utilities. Um, resources, again, you know, cities need energy, food and water, and to the extent that they can't provide them, that, that leaves their populations highly vulnerable. Um, and environmental, we looked at pollutions of all kinds, and, and also included in here the overconsumption of land due to urban sprawl. So very much at the heart of kind of the ULI uh, mantra of, you know, um, of responsible land use. That then enables us to overlay um, the cities, and I've just used five here to give you a sort of sense of the global sample. Um, and given the amount of time we've got, I won't be, have a huge amount of time to go into these, but it gives you a sense of what you can do with this type of analysis. From our perspective, it's interesting because you can start to sort of evaluate at a fund level or portfolio level how these cities compare one against another. So, you know, Vancouver, for example, you can see compare, um, performs very well in terms of vulnerability, has very low vulnerability, apart from climate, where, of course, because it's low-lying, low it's quite susceptible to sea level rise. Whereas you look at Shanghai and, and there's high levels of pollution there by comparison to Vancouver. You know, infrastructure, um, London, New York, Vancouver all perform relatively well compared to Mexico City where it's relatively poor. Um, that then enables you to sort of start thinking about the case studies of each individual city. Um, London is obviously a city we we're, have a huge presence in and therefore very interested in. Um, it ranked 18th in our study, but it's worth saying that that's obviously relative ranking out of those 50 cities and is still overall quite resilient, but um, it has the prime vulnerabilities of crime, air pollution, affordability and ageing population. And then sort of looking at each city, sort of being able to then dig down a bit deeper into that information. You know, a lot of this is stuff, I guess, which instinctively we know, but this is really just a systematic way of evaluating that in each instance. So, you know, affordability and crime are high. I think probably all of us who, who live in London know that. Um, you know, it's interesting because the crime is actually polarised into some petty crime and then also the other extreme, this sort of terrorism threat. Um, and, you know, 
Air quality is another one that comes up as medium to high. Um, and again, we're paying EU fines, we're aware of that, we know that. But I think when you start to systematically look at it and really sort of spell out the risks, it, it, it certainly helped us to sort of have that conversation about where we wanted to be. And then at a European perspective, um, I've just overlaid the cities here, and again, I won't focus on this um, for a large amount of time, but Madrid um, does relatively well. Sorry, it's quite vulnerable due to drought and um, wildfire compared to the others, but Stockholm, um, whilst low-lying, doesn't have those other risks. So you can start to see sort of how those cities perform one against the other. <clears throat> Adaptive capacity is the second element that I referred to. Um, and again, a huge number of different indicators in here. And it's worth saying that none of these are particularly weighted. We have um, provide equal weighting to all of them. So what it is essentially meant to be a tool. So if, for example, with this panel, we thought that sea level rise was of particular interest and we could weight that more heavily. But that is not something we've done yet. Um, so governance, this is about institutions um, which may vary from city to city, but the underlying principles of democracy, freedom of speech, community participation, transparency, leadership. Um, planning systems, and in this sense, we mean more. Sorry, I've, oh, sorry. Um, a good disaster management plan, rather than planning as we might think of it per se. Funding structures. So, can a city, um, you know, really borrow to? And we'll hear in, in a moment about the New York example of how they've really managed to um, to raise debt to, to fund a lot of the work that they're doing. A technological can cities are cities partnering with universities in their um, jurisdictions to really foster their expertise, that technical understanding. Um, and institutions, you know, do the, is the capacity there within governmental bodies to deliver to, um, and non-governmental bodies and community organisations, you know, is there a tr long-term track record of delivering? And adaptive capacity, you can see whilst on the other slide, New York came up as um, relatively vulnerable, which we'll see in a second. Um, it does redeem itself to an extent to on the on the adaptive capacity piece because it has put a huge amount of energy and time into thinking about what it will do in the event um, of a disaster. Um, whereas you can see Mexico City, for example, remains in ver relatively the same places, so it's quite vulnerable, highly vulnerable, and also um, with relatively low adaptive capacity. Vancouver is one of the cities that came up very well. It demonstrates low levels of vulnerability, um, apart from, as I mentioned, its sort of low-lying coastal location, um, but has strong adaptive capacity too. So it's got a strong city vision, and it has sort of you know access to funding and devolved powers, and it provides a wonderfully high quality of life. So those of you who've been there, great infrastructure, clean environment, and you know really its inhabitants en enabling them to live these healthy lifestyles. And again, similarly, I. I and put in a slide here so you can really see in the European context how the cities fare. So a, a, a real breadth um, across, um, and I won't start to talk to these, but we can come back to them in questions if it's of interest. And that then enables us to plot the cities one against the other on this graph. Um, and just very simplistically to take you through the sort of themes um, the most resilient cities that we found, the three were Canadian cities, where the economy was reasonably dynamic, there's sort of high level of resource availability, and the cities are well governed and well planned. Um, the US cities are interesting because, like New York, as I was referring to, they demonstrated relatively high levels of um, vulnerability, but yet redeemed themselves with, with high levels of adaptive capacity too. Having made that investment, having got those plans, having that sort of city vision, being able to prioritize the investment. Um, the middle group um, was more the European cities, um, so really, you know, highly developed societies with a lot of the sort of underpinnings of the strong community element that we were looking for, um, very much sort of around social e equality, and, um, but with ageing infrastructure in many instances, ageing population in many inf instances. Um, and then the weakest were the emerging markets. So whilst there's sort of been blistering um, economic glory that hadn't fed through really into the resilience of cities, um, and you know, largely this is due to the sort of inequality, poor infrastructure provision, and in many instances, environmental degradation. So I think my, my challenge to, to sort of this group and um, to ULI as a whole is, you know, how can we really work with these things? We know this is a sort of a, a disruptive force that's coming, um, how can we really engage with that and ensure that cities are not in the position of when um, many of us at the PCSI event went last year to Manila and confronted with you know, this situation where they just experienced high end and were really sort of in disaster recovery mode. You know, how can we ensure that cities are in a position to attract and retain um, foreign investment and really to prioritize that investment when it arrives to know what they want to do with that at a city level? 
So um, just to really echo um, what Jesus said in the opening, you know, the disruption has started, the effects are starting to be felt, and that's only the start, it's only gonna gain in momentum. Um, but I think you know, some hugely sophisticated thinking, which you'll hear from my co-panelists, um, is starting to emerge. You know, we can't evaluate markets in historic terms. And we need to think about new tools and really work with the finance sector, the insurance sector, et cetera, to, to leverage that to the greatest degree. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. And I believe the study is still available, isn't it? it is, yes. So if you want to get a copy, um, it's, it's available online. Yeah. Right. Um, now, g drilling down to one of the most important aspects, the role of the insurance sector. Greg. Thank you, Judith. Um, and thank you, Kate. Um, I think what Kate said, um, you know, the ability for people to um, actually understand some of their exposure to extreme weather is, is something worth noting because those tools do exist. The insurance industry has been using them for the past 25 years or so. Um, before I get into some of those tools, though, I just want to give some context as to what's going on in the insurance sector, what's, what's happening in terms of the number of meteorological events that are occurring and the trend we're seeing in losses. Um, so we all know the familiar story of growing cities. Um, you can see that many of these cities uh, are actually in the developing world. So Europe probably is not um, certainly on the radar for the cities that are growing massively in terms of the number of assets. Um, and, and many of these cities you can see that will be uh, the biggest cities in, in 2030 are actually in highly exposed regions to natural hazards. Um, so we have all this economic growth and, and exposure is growing. Um, a lot of the evidence that, that we've seen has suggested that the increased losses are due to growing exposure rather than climate risks for the time being. So this, this actually illustrates, um, you know, if, if there's no one living in a place when, when, a, when a hurricane or an earthquake hits, you, you know, it's, you're not going to experience any uh, severe humanitarian or economic losses. And this just goes to show uh, the change in, in the environment in Miami in you know, roughly the past um, 90 years or so. Um, and then when, where does climate change come into this picture? Well, it's the icing on the cake. Um, on the, on the uh, left-hand side, you can see the number of, of weather uh, catastrophes increasing. So those are only meteorological events. Um, they don't include anything from seismic activity. And on the right-hand side, you can see the number of insured losses are increasing. Um, again, we think most of this is due to growing exposure rather than climate change, but as Kate said, the past is not necessarily an indicator of where the future is going. Um, so exposure is something the insurance industry understands quite well. Um, I, I want to tell you a little story on how we've gotten to where we are today in terms of measuring risk. And it actually comes back to some of the discussion in the, in the last panel around capital. Um, right now, the insurance industry has a surplus of capital. Um, capital's pouring into the reinsurance sector, particularly in insurance-linked securities. Um, they're non-correlated assets. Um, how did investors decide to give the insurance industry so much capital when you see a lot of trends out there that would make it look like we're living in a riskier world? I'll tell you, in the late, uh, the late 80s and early 90s, the insurance industry was in an existential crisis. You had several severe hurricanes in the US, you had the Northridge earthquake in 1994, and the industry is really in shambles. Along came something called the catastrophe modeling firms. Uh, the growth in analytics and technology allowed us to actually model what the risk exposure was to particular uh, properties, particular regions, um, and we were able to begin pricing risk accordingly. It wasn't just based on a historical record of losses, it was actually based on probabilistic losses based on science and data. Um, this attracted capital back into the industry, and then it's been underpinned by a policy framework where uh, regulators have basically said insurers have to be resilient to a one in 250 year uh, loss return period. Now, uh, there is something going on right now in uh, some of the international financial regulatory world that's looking to apply this uh, similar framework to the wider economy. Um, Willis has been involved with this, but it's pr principally backed by uh, the UN, the World Bank, the International Associ of in Association of Insurance Supervisors, and it's something called the 1 in 100 initiative. Um, what 1 in 100 basically says is that anyone issuing a security or, or debt, so a bond, 
or, or a stock, whether that's uh, a company, a municipality, a state uh, government, they need to actually know their exposure to a 1 in 100 risk return period. They need to report on that to their investors to actually make this transparent. The idea is that if you, are, as an investor, uh, are looking at two companies that are otherwise identical, right now you actually don't know what the exposure to natural uh, disaster risk is. If you have that information available, it should actually give the right incentives to encourage uh, property developers, cities, uh, businesses, uh, the incentives to actually go ahead and make um, the right resilience measures. And we do this through uh, location analytics. We can see exposure very clearly. Uh, this map is actually showing um, Sendai in Japan, which was so uh, badly hit by the tsunami uh, about four years ago. And right now, insurance actually can go down to the property level. This is not happening you know, really widely, and, and the way insurance is regulated in different markets mean this is done differently depending on where you are. But we're really able to go down now to an individual property, look at that exposure, look at the engineering behind the building, and say, you know, we want to insure this building, we don't want to insure this building, and this is actually what it's going to be you know, priced at. In this room, if we're talking about commercial real estate, you do have risk differentiated pricing. In, uh, in, in the uh, retail uh, homeowners insurance situation, parts of the world, that's actually not necessarily the case due to regulation. Um, but it's not just about current exposure. Um, finance is actually tied to the availability of insurance. So when Kate was talking about sea level rise, this is actually a very interesting question. Um, sea level rise is very slow. Um, but we do think there'll be impacts certainly in the next uh, 20 to 30 years. And it's a, just a question of at what point do insurers recognize that a property becomes uninsurable? At that point, you have something we would call a stranded asset. And that means that basically a bank is not going to lend financing for something that, where insurance is not available. Right now, when you actually look at the way insurance is priced, it's based on your exposure at a particular year in time. So if you're buying an insurance program, Right now, we're looking at what the exposure is in 2015, not what the exposure is in 2050. Uh, that's because your policy only typically runs 18 to uh, 24 months. Um, but the same tools that we use to evaluate risk now, we can use uh, in a scenario basis to look at future hazards. So you can actually model based on different IPCC scenarios on you know, what is my exposure to a variety of natural hazards going to be in the context of sea level rise, et cetera, in the future. Um, so data and analytics can help us with this. Um, we can actually use 3D modeling. Um, the bottom picture is actually uh, related to a terrorism model in, in London, but we can do the same thing with, with, with flood risk. And the idea is that if you actually have this information, it, lead to, it should lead to better investment decisions. Um, and the resolution for this technology continues to grow. What does this mean? It means that you know, having this information isn't any good unless we actually improve the resilience of the built environment. And having, having that information should provide the incentive to do so. You can see the, you know, the disaster that was wrought by Hurricane Sandy in the pictures to the left. But on the right-hand side, uh, Tokyo has taken, you know, many measures to reinforce its, um, its structures to seismic risk. Um, we have some floating houses in the Netherlands, which I'm sure Hank can talk a little bit more about how the Netherlands is dealing with the issue of, 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 of water. Um, and, and all these questions, you know, come to, to, to a fore where we look at, you know, what makes a building, a building resilient? And, you know, a variety of these features will have different resilient feature, uh, uh, resilient benefits in, in different parts of the world. But, but the fact of the matter is that, you know, insurance is now actually able to take, you know, all of these into account and price the risk accordingly. Uh, but of course, Let's say you have a building and you've done a fantastic job. It's you know 100% resilient. Uh, what about the the, the uh, actual surrounding urban infrastructure? It's no good if you have a building that's you know the only one up and in, in, in standing after an event when people can't get to work, you can't get fuel or supplies. Um, so cities actually depend on the, the, these uh, masses of infrastructure, whether they're food markets, uh, sh shipping um, uh, and port facilities. Um, and, and other types of, of, of transportation. Um, and, and this is really up to the municipalities to help finance this. Um, and this is another area where insurance is actually thinking about this quite carefully. Um, for probably for about the past 15 years, there have been things called pool schemes. And these are basically um, risk pools that take 
risks that are quite difficult to insure in the private market, but use a government-led program that is then reinsured in the private market to protect against a particular category of risk. So we have these pool schemes in the UK, we have them in Turkey, we have them in the Caribbean, um, and we've actually just uh, been involved in a, in a drought risk uh, program in Africa for farmers. Um, so we have this surplus of capital. More of this capital needs to be deployed to cover a wider variety of, of, of risks and, and, and expand insurance penetration. Uh, in the developed world, typically insurance penetration is somewhere around 60% of most assets. In, in the developing world, that ranges from 5 to 20%. Um, these risk pools offer you know, opportunity in parts of the world that are, are, are less uh, developed. Um, and these can be financed for a variety of sources. The insurance industry itself, as you're all aware, has a lot of capital to deploy. So um, there has been a commitment made at the UN Climate Summit in, in September that the insurance industry is going to uh, increase by 10 times its current expenditure, um, which is going to be somewhere in the range of $100 billion a year, focused on climate smart investment, which basically is a, is a code word for resilient infrastructure by 2020. Um, and urban resilience is enhanced by the cooperation between insurers, the private sector, and governments. So the decisions we make today are gonna to be with us men, with, uh, for, for many years. Uh, if you're building a building now, um, what's actually gonna happen is that, is that building's probably gonna be around for 50, 60 years when the exposure is very, very, very different. Um, you know, we have analytics that right now in the insurance sector that have been used in the reinsurance sector, but have a lot of potential to be uh, applied to the property sector and other areas of the private sector to make the right decisions so that we're not building things in the wrong places. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg. Um, we're now going to hear from Hank Ovink. And those of us who were at the Sustainability Council yesterday heard him talk compellingly about Sandy and the uh, reconstruction. Hank is, has been based in the Netherlands, but was invited to come in and help on Sandy. So, this is a very good sort of transatlantic um, activity. He did mention yesterday that the Dutch drained um, Manhattan in the first place just before they were um, driven out. Um, it's nice to know the Dutch are back. Thank you, Judith. Uh, does it work or should I work? stay here? This? Yeah, it does. Uh, thanks. Um, talk about water. The last panel uh, before it left um, uh, said that might be a war on water. Now, water is going to affect us all. Uh, two to four billion uh, of the world's population will be affected by water, being drought, quality, or too much. 90% uh, of the current risks events around the world are water-related. So all disasters, 90% are water-related, affecting to up to 20% of the local and regional GDPs in those areas. So that means that water is a stress factor. Uh, uh, and climate change shows that the impact of climate change uh, is mostly felt uh, upon societies, upon cities and regions, upon people and businesses through water. Now, we all have known this for uh, decades or even ages when you live in the Netherlands, uh, but uh, luckily, um, uh, quote unquote, the uh, World Economic Forum report now also acknowledged that risks putting water on number one when it comes to the impact of the risk in the future. Now, that's not only interesting, it also shows that the last panel was totally right, that when it's about money, uh, you have to look at water. Uh, we are doing a, a lot of research on it in the Netherlands, to, and this is only one example of the World Resource Institute, mapping the risks of water. And this is only one part of the risk, and you know, believe me, red is not good. Uh, if you match that risk with urbanization, and we all agree, we have an urban world right now, we, uh, uh, we, will, we will get to 75%. Uh, that's already there in Europe. Again, if you match that development with the increasing risk when it comes to water, uh, you have your uh, delta of change or your objective. Now, that's the bad side, but water also connects. You all know that. You invest in places with water. You like waterfronts. You like to live in those deltas. They are prosperous places. They have great soil, uh, and you can uh, reach the world. So water is also a connector. It's an asset. But it's not an asset when it hits you hard. Uh, being sandy in New York or any other storm or typhoon in the Asian uh, region or in Africa, uh, 
uh, when water hits, it can actually kill and be devastating. Climate change comes into mind. Uh, but as Greg said, climate change is slow. Uh, so slow that any political decision or any investment decision is actually out of reach. So climate change, we look at 100 years, while the return on investment, we look at 5 to 15 years. So that's why we spend billions of dollars in the floodplain in Miami and in San Francisco and all over the world uh, at risk, not caring actually about that future that will actually come into mind. Now, President Obama immediately understood when he uh, stepped into office in 2009, January 2009, that climate change was going to be part of his, his ambition. Although the first term didn't show a lot, he started to work already on the response strategy as well as on the uh, preparedness one. Uh, and his line, you can't ignore the facts, but you can't deny it. It's pretty tough in the US when the Republican Congress uh, uh, just acknowledged that we actually can't do anything about climate change. It's up to God. This is Senator James Inhofe, and he is actually the chair of the Senate Commission on Climate Change. Yeah, you laugh, but it's actually scary. Huh? It's very scary. You know where we are. It says you are there. And we tend to look back because that is something we can actually cope with or deal with. But if you look ahead and you take climate change and sea level rise and temperature increase and urbanization, this is our future. And that future looks pretty uncertain. So if we want to deal with it in design or innovation or investment or uh, research, we have to think about that future and not so much about the past. World Economic Forum reports are great. They not only show the risks, uh, they also show that the likelihood and impact of all risks are increasing. Likelihood and impact are increasing. And those are water crises and climate change and uh, biodiversity loss, uh, but also man-made uh, environmental catastrophes. Now, that's the bad side. So that side of the slide is the bad side of the slide. The good side is that all those risks are related to each other. And you could say that's even scarier. Uh, but the good thing is that that relationship actually boils down on the urban scale, on the regional scale. And this is exactly the place where folks like you and I and uh, uh, our panelists work on. This is where we come up with finance strategies. This is where we design on and develop on. It's the scale where we can actually intervene, adapt, and mitigate upon those risks. So that interdependency is our way forward and way out. Now, this is the, the base when Sandy hit. And Hurricane Sandy was not the worst storm ever. Hurricane Sandy was a superstorm when it had made landfall. We have seen worst storms in Asia. Uh, but why do we talk about Hurricane Sandy? Uh, it's because it hit New York, and everybody knows New York, and it made climate change all of a sudden very tactile and in your face. Because every kid in Mumbai, in Istanbul, uh, in Cape Town, or in Amsterdam, knows a story about New York. And when such a city is hit, you have to exploit that opportunity. Sandy showed that World Economic Forum report is real. And I think that, you know, it's always great to have research, Ah, but when it comes to practice, you know what you have to do. It showed that the vulnerabilities in this region are great. 75% of the power supply is in the floodplain. 80% of liquid fuel storage in the floodplain. 20% adjacent. This is New York City. This is not a developing country. Well, some say it is a developing country. Uh, and I will, uh, I will show you because there... Ah, I can't reach it, actually. Uh, uh, there's a, uh, a place in Newark I visited right after Sandy, uh, and the water was almost as high as this room. Uh, it's an industrial facility, uh, social housing, low-income housing. The water was high. Storage of Agent Orange. You're old enough to understand what that is. Uh, and they had to close the playgrounds because the soil lit up at night. That's what that some of the neighbors said there. So. The soil actually didn't lit up at night, but they closed the playgrounds because it was so contaminated. And this is exactly this interdependency. It's not only physical infrastructure, it's about culture, human, ecology. Everything comes together and water actually matches that. So Sandy raised those questions on physical and social resilience across the region, showing the vulnerability across the region, taking out the power grid of Manhattan, and that in a region which is not an example of good governance or good government, 
uh, where fragmentation is actually a better word when it comes to government, where New York State and New Jersey State have different constitutions, a different leadership and a different way of implementation, where the implementation agency is actually politically bankrupt. Uh, so the MTA and the Port Authority are actually powerless when it comes to implementation. So now this is the ball game where uh, Sandy hit and Congress appropriated $60 billion uh, for eight. $60 billion. So my story is only about big numbers, you hear? $60 billion. And the president installed the Hurricane Sandy Rebuilding Task Force. When a storm hits, it takes away your house, your business. Some people lost their daughter, their wife, friends. People got killed. So when you talk about $60 billion, fragmented government, innovators and designers and engineers and scientists and investors that want to look ahead, you forget culture. Because somebody who lost his daughter is not interested in progress. Somebody who lost his house or business is not interested in the future. The only thing they want is to go back real fast to what they lost. So you have this thing that's called an opportunity, never waste a crisis, but at the same time you're in a almost cultural lock-in uh, where the people you need to overcome that crisis are in a crisis mode themselves. So matching that with 60 billion, it's not gonna work. Uh, but you need people for that. Now, Obama was very smart. He appointed uh, Secretary Sean Donovan as his chair. Donovan is a former commissioner of New York, born and raised New Yorker, architect by training, married a Jersey girl, so he knows the region by family, you could say. Uh, and uh, Donovan is also a, was a Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, now Director at uh, OMB at the White House. Uh, he's a, a, a person, a politician, who wants to know what he's responsible for. So we're thinking housing I know, the region I know, the politics I know, I know everything about finance, so I can deal, no, I don't know anything about water. So he went to the Netherlands, which is my home country, and I was Director General for Water and uh, Spatial Planning in the Netherlands, and I toured him around for two days, showing him the history by facts. Uh, we've been dealing with these water issues for not years, not decades, but ages. And if you would build a business case on that image in the middle, which is the 1500s, you would actually say, let's get out and move to Germany, uh, which actually would be, you know, at that time, not a good advice, and now actually suicide. Uh, <laughs> But it's true, you have to almost be crazy, but this delta of rivers and this prosperous land actually was the opportunity for the Dutch to, you know, to go all over the world and do trade and build cities by making land. We created land out of water, at risk all the time. So this was not about a war with water, which is always the best, worst perspective. This is about living with water, embracing the risks and turning them into an asset. We turned it into a culture, a culture where we built those polders, not only because of great engineering and design, but actually about collaboration. The only way forward was collaboration. So people got together and said, we want dry feet, let's organize our government around it. So we, before we became a kingdom, we had our first water democracy already in the 1100s. So now that's so institutional that we build our country on it, and we coped with our Sandy in 53 that took out almost 2,000 people uh, and, uh, and, and a lot of death uh, and came up with a response plan and protection strategy that is layered and embedded and ingrained in our policies, in our investments, in our regulations and in our government. We even have a commissioner for it. The guy's called Wim Kuyke and he's dedicated to the job and the only thing he does is run the country on this Delta approach. So Donovan, when he went to the Netherlands in these two days said, Henk, it's cultural. Can you make it cultural in the US? I said, well, can you make it cultural in New York? I said, well, that's a start. Uh, we've had our, our, our connection there. This is the chart of that culture in the US. 
This is the amount of money the federal government is spending in disaster response. From the 80s until now, it goes up from around 10 billion to almost 100 billion a year. And this is repair money, only band aid money. This is not money to prepare, this is money to repair. And you get this, you know, houses on stilts. And this is actually a federally funded program we call the National Flood Insurance Program. Uh, they just take away the crates and put in concrete uh, uh, stilts, and that's what it is. And this is actually the situation we have in New Jersey uh, uh, in a lot of those places. So Obama was smart. He presented the Climate Action Plan together with the Hurricane Sandy Rebuilding Strategy, and part of that strategy was innovation and a time to think. And Donovan asked me, while I was working with him in this Hurricane Sandy Rebuilding Task Force, uh, can you come up with an innovative approach so we reach for the future and not start to repair? Uh, and I said we have to create a process, a place on the edge of government, science, the region, NGOs, a place where we can trust each other, where we have an open mind, but also where all the talent of the world can actually meet the talent of the region. Create a place where we reach for the future, not forgetting the past, using design and innovation, Forget about the current structures and heroes because it doesn't work when you want to innovate. And think about what collaboration really means in this region. Think about what it means when you start to work together. And that starts with inclusive leadership. So always the door open. Not a process where you say, okay, the insurance first and make up their minds and then the bankers and then the developers and then the, the bureaucrats and then the politicians, no. Everybody in the same room thinking about this problem, knowing that the knowledge of the IPCC has to be matched with the knowledge in Asbury Park, New Jersey, as well as on Long Island. You have to make that sandwich. You have to make the match. And that became Rebuild by Design, a project I led, developed and led, uh, with support of the Rockefeller Foundation. And you will hear uh, President Dr. Judith Roden speak tomorrow, uh, partly on resilience. Um, the whole competition started with a call for talent of the world. We did a research all over the region and worked together with over 500 organizations, over 2,000 people. At the end of the research, we presented the vulnerabilities and interdependencies of the region and 41 opportunities to move forward. And if these 10 teams that were selected out of 148 got the task not to design solutions, but to build coalitions. And once those coalitions were in place, local communities, bankers, mayors, uh, community leaders, researchers from the region m being met by this leadership from the world, they started to design proposals, 10 proposals where we selected six and funded them with federal dollars. So a regional strategy of analysis and research was brought down to the level of the community, the level of the people. We matched those six projects with almost a billion federal disaster recovery funding, and we're now in the midst of the implementation process. Ten teams all over the region on architecture and landscape, urban design and planning, through all scales and time, connecting the big politics of the big people with the community and the needs on the ground. And we use design for this process to innovate, uh, and Donovan announced six winners on June 2 uh, and allocated the dollars. So leadership, collaboration, and innovation brought a cultural change by design. Now that inspired uh, the president to say, I want a national approach. So build on the success of Rebuild by Design. We did the National Disaster Resiliency Competition in 67 places all over the US. And I worked with the Rockefeller Foundation and USAID to start this grand challenge on resiliency based on that same principle of matching the talent of the world with very local need. So I could say from experience that when it comes to resiliency, the future, climate change and all those risks, it's not about making a plan, it's about changing the culture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hank. Now do, any, do I, any of you want to comment on what's come out of each other's presentations, or shall we open it to the floor? Any, any comments? The only question I have, 
uh, 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 from the report you, you did uh, uh, on resiliency and the IPCC definition on resiliency, uh, what, I, what I miss and what I try to highlight in the process we did in New York, but also doing now in other places in Africa and Asia and in other places in the US is that it's, to my understanding when I read it, it's a pass, almost a passive approach. Uh, well, I think if you can embrace risk as part of a, because, you know, World Economic Forum report is not the only report. We are facing risks all the time. So not be uh, ignorant to the risk, but actually exploit them, embrace them, use them, and be part of the culture. So I don't, I don't know how that ever came up, uh, but I was, I was hoping that would be. You have to speak up. I'm not sure it's working. Oh, there yeah. it is now. Um, one of the questions that's often asked of the report is, oh, well, does that mean you therefore wouldn't go into markets that don't come up as resilient on your rankings? Right. And that's not at all what we're saying. Hmm. So it's very much exactly what you're saying, which is, well, no, it's about understanding the risk and working with them to ensure that you're more informed making that decision rather than saying, oh, no, we wouldn't do that, because that's absolutely not the purpose of it, but it's to evaluate systematically rather than it kind of being anecdotal evidence of sort of why someone may or may not like a market, you know, and, and based only solely on the value drivers, which was always the point in the past. Yeah. Right, now, any questions from the floor? Yeah, good afternoon. Um, so, sorry, right, yeah. I was just sit, sitting next to her, so I should grab that. Yeah, good afternoon, Mark Coddington, PIE. Um, how does the panel respond to counterintuitive scientific research, particularly when it's being fed to the investor community? The two examples I give you is the global dimming research of 2002-2003, and more recently and ongoing, the clean air impacts on the intensity of hurricanes, which I believe is still taking place uh, in Mississippi and obviously in the light of Hurricane Sandy. How do you control the information going through that it doesn't have a ridiculous effect and a particularly negative impact on the investor community. I'll take another one right in the front here. Um, the old way to design cities was around transportation. So early days built around train stations, ports, and now airports. But at the same time, more and more people are having to live in cities. So you have to, how do you design them for disaster recovery? Are you going to change the whole paradigm of building them around transport? Instead, building them around people living there more and more and more? How do you balance that? Right, we've got time to take one more. Is there another question? Hello. Uh, yeah, it's a question to Henk. Um, I think it's fantastic uh, what you presented about the, 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 the Dutch uh, way of living with uh, water, living underwater for 500 years. Um, how do you, in, in, rea in reality, how realistic do you think it is to change the culture of a country like the United States, which is so completely different on every level, structurally, uh, politically, than the Netherlands? Right, who would like to begin with the first question in relation to investment? I'll, I'll try and, uh, and address that. Um, I think w what you're asking is how do we make sure that uh, particular scientific reports that come out don't scare investors away? Um, I mean, I think you know, the lessons that we've used in insurance are, are, are very clear that um, you know, we take scientific evidence we take a variety of peer-reviewed research, we employ teams of scientists, and we build models um, that give you a financial exposure. Um, you know, it's not, it's not a matter, I think, of, of suppressing reports or downplaying this or, or, or playing up something else. It's simply a, a model number that actually says, this is you know, what a, you know, a wide range of scientific studies say, this is you know, what the model is saying. The, these are the inputs from an engineering perspective, from a financial perspective, and this is actually a number, your exposure. This is your, you know, your, your one in 100 return year risk period, and this is the number that you will suffer. So if, a one in, if, 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 a, if a, there's a 1% 1 1 chance of this flood happening any year, your loss will be X number of dollars. We can do that anywhere from one in 
five years up to one in 10,000 years, depending on, on the rest. I think it's very simple. Now, who would like to deal with the, the question about um, cities and are we going to change locations? Kate? Um, yes, I was just going to um, pick up on what you were saying there because um, I'm sorry, I've just totally lost my train of thought. What was I was going to say. Um, sorry, so thinking about cities, um, let's take that one first. The density point, I think, is a really interesting one because. You know, I think in many ways, um, as we all know, people are moving to cities at an alarming rate, but actually that is also the opportunity. And so um, I think through the sort of huge level of investments that you've seen that a city like New York can attract, in many ways there's the opportunity. And I, I don't think it's about moving away from those cities. I think it's about ensuring that actually we can really leverage the number of people in that city to, to come up with a more efficient way of, um, of protecting that population from whatever disaster it is that we're thinking about in that context. Um, so that kind of goes to the heart of what I was saying about being specific about where you need the investment at the city level. And I think so much of what you see about the cities that we evaluate is if they have a clear vision, and that a lot of that is obviously around transport infrastructure, where will populations locate, how will they move around, then that becomes to sort of um, prioritise the investment coming into the city. It, I want to, before I go to the Netherlands, and use your answer and your question, uh, one of the teams came up with uh, an imagery, imagery, imagery of their proposal and said it is the, the love child of Robert Moses and Jane Jacobs. Now, that would, of course, be great if the world was uh, all babies of Robert and Jane, because uh, that is actually the match. So I don't think it's one or the other. I think it's actually the marriage of the two uh, that will have the same as a, an, an approach is never only local. It will also need to be regional or global. Uh, it can never be only social. It also has to be cultural and physical and economic and financial. Uh, so that is, I think, that cross-disciplinary, cross-scale, cross-institutions uh, is actually an, uh, not a real answer, but more a methodology and a process where you get to a different type of city design and development because it's not based on infrastructure alone, but it's also not based on a human skill or a human interest alone. So I think you need to match. Now that's perhaps partially also the answer to the question, can the US be Dutch again? Or I don't know, if that was really the question. <laughs> um, but we forgot, of course, in the 1600s to, uh, to stay, but uh, I think the the problem with the, we all will be talking net Dutch right now, it would be so easy for me. Um, the, the idea is that the culture in the US is not the culture within Congress, which I think everybody agrees. So once you get on the ground, so Hurricane Sandy did not make a distinct between Republicans and Democrats, and they actually collaborate on the ground in the region. Uh, so I think that's one. Uh, that you see, and the Brookings Institute uh, with uh, Bruce Cutts is doing a lot of uh, research as, as well as others to showcase that the regional urban scale is actually uh, the scale where people get together and build solutions, and those solutions and approaches are very forward-looking and uh, can inspire uh, the world and not only, uh, uh, and, and, and do not relate to this this very conservative culture. At the same time, I do agree with you, it's tough. Uh, and that's my last comment. Uh, when the federal government poured in $60 billion in this region, I asked the insurers uh, and the investors what their answer was. And they actually said, was there a question? And I said, no, but it's an opportunity. If a federal government pours in $60 billion, and for the, even for a city like New York, that's a lot of money, uh, and it's tough to spend. Uh, could it emerge, could that start uh, a collaboration between public and private? And the problem in the US is actually there's the distrust between government and society is so enormous uh, that I think that is the, the cultural change uh, uh, part of the process has to focus on. Well, can I say a huge thank you to the panel because they've covered an enormous amount of ground and I hope they've whetted your appetite for further sessions on different parts of resilience and sustainability coupled with extreme weather.